Hey, welcome everybody back to Cyberry's weekly podcast. Today we're joined by X Mode. Uh, Mary and Josh are here along with Jonathan from Cyberry. Um, I'll let uh, our guests introduce themselves. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Joshua Anton. I'm the CEO of X Mode and um, um, very excited to be on the podcast. I'm Mary Sather. I'm responsible for our sales organization. Awesome. And Jonathan, if you want to give a quick intro. Yeah, just so you guys know, um, I'm Jonathan. I'm the, I guess my official title is the principal infrastructure engineer. Um, so I handle everything from dev hits commit all the way through the production site and all that fun stuff. And then I'm, Mike and I also handle IT. So we get to deal with that that fun show. Um, but yeah, so I do all the DevOps, all the cloud infrastructure stuff, all the tooling and connecting of the pipes. Yep. And because uh, I always forget to uh, introduce myself because I do so many of these, uh, Mike Ruin, VP of Engineering and CISO here at Cyberary. Uh, you'd think by now I'd be good at this. Um, so yeah, so we wanted to talk to uh, you guys from X Mode, and uh, maybe a great place to start, Josh, would be to tell us a little bit about the company and what you guys do. Uh, 100%. So um, we um, went on to start, am I giving maybe a little backstory, kind of how we got here? That works Yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right, awesome. So, you know, we started off as a college safety app back in uh, 2013, 2014. You know, uh, we grew that app to about uh, 2 million folks. And, you know, what we discovered was, you know, A, how to build a phenomenal, you know, uh, location technology, uh, collecting location every five to seven minutes, uh, speed, bearing, vertical accuracy, the IoT Wi-Fi sensors around you, essentially the perfect location tech to create the perfect uh, visitation, uh, movement score and context around a visitor movement score. Uh, we understood the value of getting consent, you know, for sharing location data, and we had a lot of had a lot of early on contracts uh, monetizing location. Fast forward, um, you know, a few years, about three years ago, we pivoted the company. Uh, we're now about fifty folks, and we see about uh, fifty million people a month and about thirty million people a day on our platform. And what we do as a company, um, really, two sides of our business. Uh, on the supply side, think of that as a data business in a box. We go up to publishers that have real amazing uh, location-based features. Uh, they typically sign you know, exclusivity. Uh, we pay them for their location data. We help them grow. And we automate their privacy compliance for them for our software development kit, whether it's uh, for CCPA, GDPR, which is privacy-based legislation. Um, we then take this location data as a panel, and we license this into multiple verticals. Um, in fintech, uh, people use their location data to trade on the stock market. In uh, low tech, they use it to figure out, you know, where to build their next buildings. In ad tech, it's to measure advertising effectiveness. And of course, uh, for cybersecurity, it's for threat intelligence to block people from stealing people's information online and so forth. So that's x -Men. Oh, awesome. So uh, Mary, um, I think... Uh, I'd love to hear more about the from the cybersecurity perspective how we're see, how you guys are being used in that sort of arena. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, cyber firms leverage X modes near real time daily data feed as well as our rich historical data to predict and prevent cyber crime. So, what I thought I'd do is go through three high level use cases on how our data is being used today. So, the first one is vulnerability risk assessments, and that's where we started. And so cyber security firms, as well as cyber insurance companies, use this data. They'll geofence a campus or maybe a military, excuse me, a government facility, <laughs> and, and, um, and then understand the infrastructure that they're capturing. Are they capturing mobile devices, potentially in an area that there should be none, or Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. Bluetooth signals? And sometimes that's just employees. Um, flouting the rules, but sometimes it could be malicious intent. And mm -hmm. so with that information, they can then lock that down and correct that behavior or prevent things from happening. Um, the second, which is the bulk of our business, is the threat intelligence that Josh mentioned. Mm -hmm. So we this can be anything from denial of service attack, ransomware, phishing, bot, financial um, fraud, uh, credential stuffing, invoice scams, anything along that line. And how we aid in that is that we can identify the GPS of the mobile devices that are sending these emails. From there, the cyber companies, they work with the ISP to identify the MAC address. 
Mm -hmm. In some cases, X-Mode's data, we're picking up, if we're identifying a Bluetooth device, we are picking up the MAC address so we can save them a step. But either way, that helps them then to identify a host, in some cases, potentially down to the user level. So our data is typically integrated into an AI platform with multiple other data sources and, and different types of data. So they can see associations and patterns. And a recent cool example is our data was used with other data uh, to identify there was two known overseas organizations that are being tracked. And our data showed that they were meeting regularly and that they were sharing the same infrastructure. So that helped the cybersecurity firms say, okay, we need to attack this as one big, large organization, not two separate organizations. So that, that was cool. And then lastly, um, is threat intelligence, or excuse me, insider threat. And um, this is a huge area. And we're really right now just on the periphery of this. And how we help is with malware transmission. So similar concept in that we can geofence when the known instance of malware infection occurs, uh, either on a corporate building campus and see, uh, identify the devices in that area. And then the next instance do the same thing. And then do they start to see, okay, we see the same device in all these instances. Is it a contractor? Is it a disgruntled employee? Mm -hmm. um, they also use it for outsider threat as well, say a local Starbucks where no, it's known that employees go, that someone's specifically there trying to transmit malware. So it's all very exciting. This field is changing rapidly. We find new use cases all the time and we really collaborate with the firms that we work with. If there's data fields that they need that can help them uncover um, you know, new attempts or new ways to, to go around the system, as well as if there's countries, then that's typically most of the requests that we get, if there's specific known countries bubbling up with cells and that are focused in uh, this, this area, then we can work with them to try to increase our data panel from those countries. So it all, it's all very exciting. It sounds very exciting. Nice. Yeah, so um, this is super interesting for me because a lot of my undergrad, I did a bunch of undergrad research and some publications and stuff on uh, studying human behavior through uh, geotemporal mapping. I guess is the technical name of all this stuff. Um, and so I was lucky enough to have like access to like very interesting data sets in 2007, eight and nine. Um, because, so I, I, went to, uh, I went to West Point. And so back then um, we had this interesting thing that one of, my, one of my good buddies was kind of studying was basically uh, communication patterns uh, through email, like how does like a, a hierarchical organization start to like form and like who's the most influential person and things like that through like email traffic. And so we were able to basically read email traffic, like we just had access to crazy data. And so we could just basically study the email traffic of this like military hierarchy um, and kind of see who the influential people were. Um, and so I took it a step further. And so this was back when Blackberry Bolds first came out. Um, and so I kind of, I wrote a script that basically phones home every 30 seconds so that we could get location data so that we kind of overlay that over, um, because there's this like theory of like, maybe a leader's not an email type guy. He's more of like a face to face, like let's have an interaction. And so there's like a bunch of generalizations you can make. Like if two people are in the same place for more than a minute, you could assume some sort of interaction occurred, um, and so it was super interesting because I ran all this on like, I think I had like 50 Blackberries that were sending me data and I was running it on like a laptop in my, my dorm room. Um, and so it was like super interesting to see how this thing like started to evolve. And what's crazy is it like, the military was looking to use it very similar to how you're selling it to them now, which I think maybe I should have gotten there first now that I think about it. Um, <laughs> we should have hired but, you way back. <laughs> yeah, we were, uh, so we were trying to do it to like detect uh, not necessarily like uh, people that would just deviate off their normal path for the day, right? Like you have this path that you follow every day. And like when groups of cadets would go out on trips, like there was like known fences where they should be. And if something were to happen to them, you should get like an alert that says like, hey, this guy is kind of like not where he's normally at or supposed to be. And it's kind of like a red flag. And they were starting to look at it uh, to kind of like go down that path with it. 
Um, but I was doing it more of like the whole like hierarchical, like self-forming networks, network science was big at the time um, and kind of doing things like that. So like, that's super interesting to see that like this idea is like taken off and like things are actually like doing things like that, um, which is kind of cool. I assume that's how you started. Like the first version of this was like, I assume on a laptop in a room, just kind of collecting data or kind of how did that, how did that like start to come around where you started? Like, how did you start pulling in the data? I guess from a technical perspective, I'm nerding out. I guess. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, so how we started, um, it's a little, uh, <laughs> it's a little, you know, we started off actually from an app side. So everything that we do is mobile. Um, yep. Actually started because when I was uh, was University of Virginia, you know, girl had a, a girl had a crush at the time, basically a uh, drunk dialed me, and we wanted to build an app around that. So we built out a location based app for college students, you know, where. It stopped you from drunk dialing your friends. It allowed you to find your drunk friends so you didn't lose them. And it showed you where you went last night. Um, it also showed you where the best parties were around you. So kind of to the temporal thing you're talking about, hotspots, which would show what areas are busy, could also be used yeah. for the same technology for, you know, kind of what you're referring to as well. Um, you know, we had to, what was interesting is because college students were using this to ensure that their friends were safe, sororities and fraternities were using this across the country, we had to refine our location technology. We had to add in Bluetooth and Wi-Fi to ensure that it was accurate. Is I'm sure if you know in non COVID yeah. times when you've gone to bars yeah. and stuff like that, you know the GPS signal isn't the cell signal isn't great, and so you have to leverage Wi-Fi or the Bluetooth signal to do that. That technology yeah. obviously has been phenomenal, obviously, and how it's been applied. <laughs> yeah. So I had that problem because once you like when I was tracking people, once you go into these big academic buildings it's basically a black hole. Like you have, you would get these like random spikes as like GPS is picking up out a window, some other tower would recognize you. And so I like that, if I would have had another year, I guess, undergrad, which I didn't get, um, you, I would have, I was trying to build out the like, cause I guess Bluetooth was like back in 2008, eight, eight and nine, like it was still very early trying to do that technology. And so like, I was trying to write it myself and that's where I kind of like drew the line. I was like, I don't have enough time to like go down this rabbit hole trying to like locate people through the, I guess the, the thing at the time was, I don't know if it still is, um, was like the Bluetooth beacon thing where it's basically you're connecting, you're collecting the Mac address that it sees and they use it, I guess, in retail to like determine people that are right. coming in and things like that. So, um, but that was like brand new. And I, that was like, I was like, this is too much. Like, this is too much work for one person. Like, I'm just, I can't, I can't do that anymore. But that's, yeah, that's, that was the challenging part for me. And it's like, it gets really complicated. Like, it's not, it's not like an easy, people are just like, oh yeah. And it's like, well, then how do you overlay that onto like a map to know they're in the same room and like signal transmissions and things well, like that? Yeah. Even now it's complex. I mean, we got into this in 2013, so right. five years after the emergence of the smartphone. And I'm sure you guys remember like, we were still not always accurate, but Waze and Google Maps, you know, back in the day used to drain the hell out of your battery and oh, it wasn't yeah. super accurate either. Right. Um, you know, we, it's, and then think about like how you use Bluetooth technology. You need other smart devices, not just beacons, but, you know, the arrival of like the AirPods here, you know what I mean? Where yeah. you can now start to pick off different signals. I would say over the last few years, like wearables and smart washers and all of those things have definitely emerged. But back in 2000. Yeah. It definitely was not a thing. So, <laughs> yeah, no, elevation is like, <laughs> well, an elevation is another big one, right? Like, it's one thing to know on a on a map, right? That's pretty easy to figure. Oh, well, not pretty easy, but like triangulating on a map. But then once you move into that sort of third dimension and realize that there's buildings and they could be on different floors, you need a lot more data to really figure out where they are. Um, I imagine that's a fairly big challenge as well. Well, yeah, accelerometers back in 2008, 2011 weren't even like <laughs> at all. Right. Like we started collecting vertical accuracy and BLE like a few years ago, but that mm -hmm. was at a point where by that point we weren't draining someone's battery. They weren't going from, yeah. <laughs> you know, 85% to 25 in a day or in a few hours because of that. It's technology, battery life, um, and just, you know, the smart things around you, all of that has really evolved, I would say, over the last five years to make, I think, this kind of, I guess, overall ecosystem possible, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like mine was written as a Java app that was basically malware that I put on their phones. 
I mean, they agreed to it um, because they got a BlackBerry, right? Like back in 2009, you're like, oh, you're going to give me a BlackBerry? Like, yes, track everything. Like, I don't mind. Um, so I wrote this like Java app that would just suck your battery. Like it right. was just like, people were just like, I have to have this thing constantly plugged in. And I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry. Like you'll get four hours, like just charge it in the car and things like that. Um, but like I was doing like real basic stuff and it was still just crushing battery. Um, I remember like I was, I didn't want to build anything cause I was lazy. Like, you know, the best, the best kinds of programmers lazy. Right. And so it would just dump the location data into a, a Google earth XML file. And that's how I would iterate like all my reports and stuff like that. I was like, I don't want to deal with this stuff. And so like most of my research papers, just screenshots from Google Earth, because it would just automatically import the, the trace, I guess is what they called it. Mm -hmm. um, and it was super interesting because like these are all like important people. And I'd be like, huh, weird. You're not allowed to leave campus, but like you're over here, like in three towns away. Like, yeah, it's kind of weird, guys. Should I report you? And um, things like that. Uh, but so... I guess it's also interesting because I guess it's interesting to see, I, I'm sure you've seen it, um, Apple's new like find my device thing that's kind of using all of these things. Have they started, have they talked about like opening up that API or is it still just straight like low so, level them? So I have this conspiracy theory that the next update <laughs> you know, for Apple is they're going to basically replace your phone is going to be your credit card or your identity, and they're going to yeah. leverage all the smart things around you. And that's why they've been doing all these like weird privacy updates and so forth is that they're basically making, where's my phone? They're making the phone basically your exact identity. Mm -hmm. So yeah. everything around you that you connect to is basically a offshoot of your phone. Um, what was interesting, even though the iOS 14 update had a lot of, um, had a lot of, um, you know, removing the device ID, all of those things, it actually allowed you, allowed further expansion into the Bluetooth ecosystem, which I up to this point, I would say Android has invested a lot more in. So I know that we're upgrading our SDK to be able to scan for Bluetooth on iOS because it's now something that we can do with a separate permission, which really wasn't a huge thing. And I know they're all right. also investing in Bluetooth wide bands, uh, wide bands, I think I'm saying that right, which I think is going to further that, where Apple's really creating, and if you look at a lot of their acquisitions like Nest and them, this kind of smart ecosystem around you in urban air, urban and some rural areas as well, that I think um, I think is going to, it's all leading up to this, I guess, 10-year vision from when Steve Jobs passed away. You know, this is ecosystem around you. That's my conspiracy yeah. theory. Could be completely wrong. <laughs> I wonder, how does it, I wonder, is this the new one that's coming out in whatever the new iOS is where they basically spoof MAC addresses now. And so it's like, it always looks like a unique ID that joins Wi-Fi and things like that. I wonder if they're eventually going to find a way to do that in the Bluetooth space mm -hmm. where they can basically, basic, I guess, make all beacons irrelevant because they can no longer track you. I, it, your conspiracy theory might be right because then it's like, well, you have to come through Apple if you want the data, right? But like, I don't know if that's a bad thing because then it's like, well, if I'm giving it to you, then I'm, with their new privacy stuff that it's like, maybe it's more secure coming from them selling it like anonymized. And I feel safer than just like, you know, the local safe way that's like triggering every time I'm going in and starting to build some weird maps about my life and eating habits. I don't know if they're going to sell the data. I think it's well, it's still the walled garden approach. I can't see Apple moving away from that, but I feel like that they're, so if you think of some of the acquisitions they've made, like it's definitely been around the smart home and kind of that closed ecosystem. I have this conspiracy theory that if you've noticed on the UX of the more recent phones, when you pull down and turn off Bluetooth, it's only temporarily. Like they don't fully turn yeah. it off. And I believe that they're scanning probably a lot of like internally everything that's smart device around you for competitive intelligence. Like See, I, now I assume the turning off, because the same is true for Wi-Fi. You turn it off, it's like, oh, I'll turn it back on in the morning. Um, I assume, and maybe I like your conspiracy theory better, but from a, from a like support perspective, this isn't connecting to the device. Like, I think there's just so many people who just forget to turn things back on. Mm -hmm. Um, and I wonder if that was basically just the feedback of people don't turn things back on. So we'll just turn it back on for them. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. Well, I think Apple's moving into this, this consent based model too. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. but, but don't get me wrong. Their ecosystem, 
you know, what they're building is this kind of every smart device is Apple, basically. Right. You know? um, yeah. Wait, Mary, well, it's is- interesting because it's interesting because you could it's it's almost like they're not selling your data, but you as the user have all that data information on your phone and you can just choose to allow apps access to basically that data. Right. Like they kind of did that with like the health data mm-hmm. where it's like an app can request all your health data. I wonder that maybe makes it easier for you guys if Apple's building out all the technology and then you just have to ask the user for permission to access all of that stuff. And then hmm. it's, it's, it's uh, Apple. What I, and I'm an Apple guy from the phone's perspective. I'm a windows guy when it comes to computers, what I've loved about um, iPhones is that it is, they are all about the user experience. They're all about making sure the user, you know, knows what's going on. They have consent for this. And you know, by having this kind of, as you said, this bifurcated system where people can opt into sharing their data to specific purposes, but at the same time, right, they have some control over it. Uh, and Apple's benefiting from it because they, how do they make their money? Not necessarily on software, yeah, right. but on the hardware products, right? It's kind of this, um, it's, it's very smart how they're kind of creating this kind of double opt-in ecosystem. Well, I mean, they're going to make it on software, right? Because the app store cuts, right? Like as people start, like it's... and then Well, they make their money on other people. They that? make their money on hardware and other people's software. I think we can... Yes, yes. No, because like, <laughs> look at iCloud though. Like your iCloud storage is only, you're only ever going to keep upgrading, right? Like it's not mm-hmm. like you're going to cleanse yourself of all your data and start over, right? So you're going to, you're just going to need a place to store all that data and back it up to iCloud, which is going to bump you from the 50 gig to the 200 gig, right? Like it's, it's just, it's getting you to just come back. Oh, I spent a thousand dollars on my new phone on a payment plan. And I looked at it and I was like, (laughs) I, um, I spent a thousand bucks on my phone. I'm like, did phone prices go up? And I was like, no, I'm just paying for the storage basically. Oh, I'm both. Um, I'm pretty sure I pay like almost 10 bucks a month with a combination of Apple, iCloud, and then Google Gmail storage, actually. So I'm basically paying a Netflix fee to store my life. (laughs) Yeah, I think I have the same. I have to Google backup to backup in case Apple has a bad day because there was that one time that scared me when iCloud went down because I I don't know, it was like two or three years ago and it was like it came down to like, somebody flipped the wrong circuit breaker in a data center and it just caused mm. like a, a spiraling outage in iCloud. And I was like, ah, I'm going to get some backup to my backup. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm just afraid something like that's going to happen again. Although it probably will not happen again because I think that guy was fired, but you know. <laughs> oh, God. And probably much more problems. Flipping circuit breakers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> my solution is eight terabytes yeah. in the basement, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, because nothing could ever go wrong there. It could never fly. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Well, no, I have the offsite, with, which is the cloud stuff. I mean, I have it in multiple places. Yeah, it's, it's the Pied Piper, you know, box <laughs> you know, in the basement. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> oh, that Pied Piper box. Oh. So, yeah. So, no, I mean, almost, yeah. Uh, go on, Jonathan. Nope. You're good. Okay. Uh, no, I was just curious, trying to bring it back around to what you guys do and, and sort of the story and the, the journey you've been on. So, um, you guys started in this uh, space with sororities and fraternities and college students and sort of helping to keep them safe. Um, how did like how did it go from there? Like what was what moved it further beyond that? Yeah, so it, it's interesting when I um, when I did my first ever pitch, you know, for my for my for my first investor, um, you know, uh, he asked me essentially what do you want this to turn into? And I said, I want to make a ways for humans, a living map for, for your life, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's never, now I thought we were going to create a bunch of consumer apps and create this living map, like a Google map around people. Um, but, you know, a lot of things kind of fell into place, I would say, uh, at the end of 2016, 2017, 2016. So we were using, uh, we actually outsourced our initial location technology. Um, and that was the worst mistake I could have done. It drained about a, <laughs> I remember this, it was uh, draining almost a third of our battery life a day. Um, we, uh, draining a third of our battery life a day. We had these early on contracts monetizing location 
And we obviously, you know, because we were named drunk mode, we wanted to get consent for sharing this location data. So <laughs> we tried, we, we, we kind of stumbled on it. And when we closed our seed round, we had a lot of early angel investors that, you know, had said, you know, you have, you understand, uh, you know, what a publisher has to go through to monetize, you know, build out privacy, all of those things. You have these early on contracts monetizing and we had to build out a technology so we didn't lose all of our users. So in four months, we had to build a technology that only drained 10% of your battery life at that time. Right. So we had two years refining that. And, um, you know, uh, a good friend of mine would, says that, you know, you, when you pivot a company, you're both lucky and smart. You have to be both of those. Um, and what he said about us was that we were smart to build our own technology, um, but lucky to have the contracts monetizing location as we pivoted. Um, mm-hmm. So we solved the chicken before the egg. Um, and once once we closed our first few contracts and like the quarter we pivoted, I think one of the hardest things, you know, just because it was you know our baby, right? was actually shutting down drunk mode to focus on basically building out the business. Um, you know, but if we had not built out the technology, had not gone through the horrible experience that we did around losing a majority of our users because we were using a third-party technology that mm-hmm. didn't work. And we were, and we were, we were basically trying to monetize at the time, I don't think we would have had the foundation for what X mode was today. And ironically, because we knew nothing about the market. We and we were an AOL's incubator. We researched, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Mary, like 800 different companies in the space to like pinpoint exactly where they were going to go, right? <laughs> and um, you know that that allowed us to kind of understand basically where, you know, how to differentiate ourselves because we were at we were basically that small that small you know engine that thought they could, you mm-hmm. know. Uh, Mary, did I miss anything on that? No, that was perfect. Although I would actually, I would add, but then brands started reaching out to us. And that's also when the light went on. It's like how valuable this data is. They either wanted to push uh, messages to college students who are out partying at night, come to our restaurant or um, an ice cream shop, wanted to understand foot traffic in a college town in the summer. That's the big time of their business, but are there enough people around? So then we really started to understand the value of data. Yeah, and, and uh, exactly, uh, exactly, Mary. Like, and to add on to what you said too, um, I remember, you remember the Neighbors too. Remember the movie that came out a few years ago? Uh, it was so cool. We had um, Seth Rogen's uh, studio, like uh, for Universal contact us, and they wanted to, to do basically a campaign in their app, showcasing Neighbors too, you know, with drunk mode. And they wanted to understand the lift and how many people went into the into the movie theaters after that. And uh, you know, to to Mary's point on the data side, it was um, it was the first time we realized oh, this is crazy. Not only can we advertise Neighbors Two to a really unique audience, but they want to understand exactly the lift on those campaigns, like how many of our users went to movie theaters afterwards to potentially see that movie. And we realized that was a much bigger business than we thought at the time. All right, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, I, that's super powerful. Like, I can't. Yeah, I I hope that person got a raise at the <laughs> the uh, the the movie studio because, like, right? It's like it's very difficult to like kind of be like, oh yeah, you know, ticket sales are up, but like, how do you attribute it to like our campaign? Whereas you guys can easily just be like, no, here's your here's your evidence. Like, the, I, that's probably. I don't know. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like the easiest sell ever, right? <laughs> yeah, they they came to us and made it super easy. I was like, can you do that? I'm like, yeah, we've got the location. We've got the users and they're probably going out tonight. So <laughs> this is perfect. <laughs> and then obviously, you know, taking it past it, you know, we realized that, you know, hundreds of apps in the app store, you know, have the same issue. And it's a, it was a much, much larger, you know, you know, industry than just, um, you know, attributing for movies and stuff like that. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm just thinking Scary, about all the different crazy. places. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're just, you're like replaying like, oh crap. Like, I, yeah, I wear a tinfoil hat in my spare time. So uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 It's one of those things that like you think of the advertising ecosystem, like, you know, 70% of our business is, you know, outside the advertising industry. And we love that because they really do appreciate the quality of our data 
Like there isn't a such a thing as financial fraud because that gets you arrested, right? Or cyber fraud because that's what we're trying to stop, right? Or or even um, or even like uh, real estate fraud because you know they want to understand how people are visiting. You know, the ad tech ecosystem is one of the few places where ad fraud is considered a way of doing business, right? <laughs> and you know, I, I think that um, I think that um, the idea that we can help you know prevent a lot of that. And, you know, we can actually attribute, hey, you just saw an ad. It's not just the impressions, but, you know, here is the change instead of a click online, the change in behavior uh, based on, uh, you know, two weeks ago versus now that we drove real customers to our, to this retail venue, right? And I think that's really powerful considering, you know, you have a lot of mom and pop shops that, you know, they have very finite advertising dollars and you have a lot of brands that are trying to figure out how to best place their advertising dollars. and you know, I think the idea of having a, a technology, a Comscore Nielsen-like product, essentially, to measure if that advertising campaign was effective, I think brings a lot of trust into that industry. And so, uh, and it's all anonymized as well. So it's that's even more powerful. It's just changes in visits. Thanks yeah. a lot, son. So, so then how did, how did the cybersecurity aspect of it all come in? Like, how did that evolve? I'll let Mary take that one. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, we were, were contacted by companies, as I said, originally with that vulnerability assessment piece. And then when people saw the data fields that we were collecting and then the granularity and accuracy of the data that we were collecting you know, versus others in the industry that might see a device once a day, you know, we're seeing it hundreds of times a day. So a real detailed pattern can be determined from that. Uh, Have you guys done any work so, with like hospitals or anything like that with regard to like just finding equipment within the building and stuff like that? I know uh, I have a friend who has a works at a company that does a lot of that. Like, and I know that's a, a big thing of um, it's hard to what happened to the portable x-ray machine. Um, sometimes it, it sort of disappears. Yeah, we're yeah. not really in the RFID uh, space, but with COVID-19, we're absolutely supporting uh, research around that. We're working with the state, with the federal, understanding movement, predicting hotspots, what areas of social distancing, what are not to help with reopening, how to, the effects of the supply chain, uh, reopening the economy. It's, it's, it's uh, and we're working globally as well with universities right. and researchers all around the world. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Do you guys... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say COVID-19 has been kind of insane. Like we've had paying clients that I have not never, never thought would ever be paying clients from universities to, um, you know, World Bank. We've built a partnership with on the international side, which is on our you know website and so forth. Like it's and it's really cool to kind of kind of see the applications where from the health use case, it's, you know, we don't want to be we want to keep it as anonymous as possible you know, leveraging our data to understand, okay, there was a bunch of outbreaks here. Where, you know, on an all overall basis, what was the trend of where people went after that to understand if an outbreak mm. is going to occur here in the next few days? Like that has literal life-saving potential. Um, and it's been super cool to work with multiple universities and uh, SLGs actually, and a few others to be able to kind of power these products and really make a difference. So... Do you guys do any of the like analytics on it or are you guys straight only in the like collecting and storing and like basically the data governance part of that type of situation? Uh, yeah, so we consider ourselves the AWS for location. So we want to help people build their products. So while we do have a context engine that we, you know, augment visits and so forth to it, we're much more focused on working with partners and give two examples that are public, you know, Tectonics as well as OmniSci, right? Uh, leveraging our where they build their visualizations off of our location technology. So Tectonics obviously has worked, um, you know, quite a bit, you know, with us. You've probably seen them all over the news, where they're literally showcasing here's an outbreak that happened in um, in uh, in Michigan or with the meatpacking plants and Tyson's Food, and you know, clients as well as you know, news outlets are leveraging these visuals powered by our X modes location data to understand essentially what, what happened afterwards, right? You know, where did all of these supply train trucks go, right? And um, can we use this insight, you know, uh, through tectonics as visuals in this case, to understand uh, essentially if there's a, there could be an outbreak that may occur, you know, overlaying other data sets to it. 
Uh, Mary, let me know if I'm missing anything there. I know nope, you've been much more involved. <laughs> so. Interesting. So of all the things along the way, I mean, uh, I like to ask this question of a lot of companies, as they, especially in the early stages, as they, you know, looking back, um, what's something that maybe you are, in retrospect, you're really glad you said no to? Like, I think a lot of things that differentiates companies that make it from those that don't are the, the there's all of these opportunities and you can sort of say like, oh yeah, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this. But really, I think it's the companies that have that discipline to say, we're not going to do that, even though it seems like a great idea. It's right in our wheelhouse. Um, is there anything along your journey that like sort of fits in that category? Yeah, so I'll give you like the um, probably uh, legacy and then probably something more recently. So um, we have tried to stay away from politics and protests, right? Basically, the very, what I would call not very bipartisan type issues, right? Um, politics, because if you just look at Cambridge Analytica, I don't want to touch that with a, with a, with a silver spoon. Um, and, you know, we've taken, we've taken some stances of, you know, is this the right thing, you know, to do, right? And um, I would say with politics and protests by, we were one of the first data companies, you know, to take a stance to say, you know what, we're not going to, we're not going to track protesters, you know, in the Black Lives Movement matter, no matter if people contact us, which we may have had folks who did, right? Um, we're going to take a stance and walk away from this because it's the right thing to do. Um, but we built our business model and, and our company and our and our values on trying to do the right thing and saving a few lives in the process, even from the old school, you know, um, consumer days. And so, right. um, and I think that led to a lot of positive employee morale, but also, you know, our vision of Xmode is to set the standard for location data. And part of setting that standard is, is um, you know, making hard choices that not everyone's going to agree with, but that is the right thing to do. And so um, I'm definitely glad that we took that stance because I think from a brand equity and just the, the right thing to do, I mean, you're talking about people's information that, um, you know, I think that I'm hoping and I, I'm hoping and I think other companies appreciate it that they'll follow our example. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's counterexamples. I'm not going to name any names, but uh, during the Baltimore riots um, a couple of years ago, there was a, a company that thought that they would be helpful by working with authorities, sort of released information, and that really uh, blew up in their face in a, uh, in a in a really bad way. And it made, um, I think, it left some bad impressions um, across the board, both within the tech community and and the broader community and society. And um, I think right companies need to sort of retro recognize like, you know what, this is, this is an area that maybe I shouldn't be playing in or, or it's just, you know, um, having those values. It's always, um, it's always nice to see. 100%. And like health, I know kind of circulating back to your example yeah. before health has always been this kind of interesting animal for us because when it comes to COVID-19, we want to be extremely helpful. So we've taken this stance internally that, you know, uh, how we deal in health is what would you be comfortable sharing at a Thanksgiving dinner table with your family? Mm -hmm. If you're not comfortable sharing it, stay away from it. Interesting. So COVID-19, you know, better good for, you know, for the better good. Getting into an accident, you know, and having to go for plastic surgery, definitely a no. Yeah, I don't know that my family would be happy if I shared COVID-19 with them at Thanksgiving, but... <laughs> Well, and 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 not to be <laughs> well, and I'm being more anonymized. Um, no, you, I know. I'm just being a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you shared out COVID nineteen at Thanksgiving, that would not be no one would be very thankful for that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think it'd be super interesting to look at the data um, post COVID nineteen of where all these people are moving, right? Because we're seeing all these people move out of the like the major the major cities. Um, yeah, super interesting to me because I, I I do full time travel, so like I'm I'm always remote, and I, I was always traveling um, prior to the COVID and the Corona times, um, and so super interesting. I like especially like I know a, a, a bunch of governments and things like that are starting to like, so I know Hawaii in particular because um, I'm here now is like going through this like weird I don't want to say like identity crisis, but they've realized that like tourism is this like thing that can just stop instantly and then they're kind of like stuck um so they're trying to like come up with ideas on how to diversify and do things like that 
And one of the options they're kind of like looking at and doing things for is like remote workers and things like that is like, how can we get some of these people that like work remote fully that no longer have to go into the office and things like that? How can we get them to Hawaii and have them live in Hawaii and provide, you know, buy stuff and do all that and not take jobs from locals for things like that. They're like kind of thinking like, how do I do that? I know a bunch of countries are doing that now too. Um, I think it'd be interesting to use your data to like kind of predict and start to do some interesting targeting, I think ad wise, but maybe I'll start a company and do that. Yeah. Well, well we could be a customer and um, I will have yeah. to <laughs> and work yeah, yeah. for a few months. I love the food over there and the weather. So yeah, it's great. Yeah, I'm thinking like co-working spots. Oh no, I'm I I'm not gonna sleep tonight now. Um <laughs> well, where yeah, are you, you could just um I'm on Oahu right now. Okay. So North yeah. Shore or Honolulu? Uh no, I'm on uh the east side. I'm uh in Kailua right now. So okay. last time I was here, I lived on the North Shore. So now I'm kind of trying to pick a different spot. Uh it's nice because I live in Lanikai and so I can bike. To uh, there's a co-working spot in Kailua called Treehouse that I work out of. Um, mm-hmm. And so I can like bike every day and then I can bike everywhere and don't need a car, which is rare, like in most of Hawaii to not need a car. Um, I have a car just because when I want to go in Hollywood and stuff like that. But um, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot nicer to be able to bike places. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, because last I was in Europe uh, a couple months ago. And so like the bike share programs are getting super popular everywhere. Like I was in Mexico City. And Uber had their jump bikes everywhere. And so that just, that's infinitely better than driving and sitting in traffic and all that kind of fun stuff. But, mm-hmm. Well, especially yeah. on the south side of the island too. So I've been a few times, so I'm uh, familiar. I don't, I don't think I've visited it. I think the only place I haven't visited is actually where, you, where you're at, but I've gone North Shore all the way around. I think just the, the east side of it. So we're getting too, too much in the Hawaii job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all right. Yeah. Yeah. Mike hears about it all the time. Yeah. So. <laughs> the time zone difference i'm one of like uh it's not bad uh it like the last time i was living on the north shore i was working east coast hours mm. which was like super bad um mm-hmm. but now we've kind of matured as a technology organization in cyber and so me doing what i do infrastructure wise and things like that it actually benefits being on like off hours that's just what I he says while his boss is on the line <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, no, and then I it was better when you were in once. Singapore, and it was twelve hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was just oh, so much. Singapore is also, you know, you take. <laughs> yeah, well, I would take down, I would take down like a staging stack or like a development stack where you know salespeople are doing demos or digging around at like the up and coming features and things like that, and I would need to do an upgrade, and I would just take it down, um, and people get very upset. But I was like spoiled because I'd been used to being on 12 hour shit, like 12 hour opposite. And so I would just do it my normal day. And then when I was back on the East Coast, I would just take down a service and people lost it. Like when I took it down in the middle of the day. So that's how I validate. It's good for me being off hours. Um, so that's a, that's a good validation. <laughs> yeah. So now the question is, how do I get his location data so that I can just track him around? Uh, that's what I need to do. Yes, oh, you what are you talking about? <laughs> I know, I know. I built a I built a thing through shortcuts that like when I land on a new place, like Mike gets a there's a private Slack channel that we have. Um and so basically I'd use the Apple shortcuts and it grabs the location data and the weather data and it sends it to a Slack channel so that like he's kind of like always relatively aware of where I am in the world. Um which is similar to what you're probably asking. I just don't give you full-time access, um, <laughs> which is fine. I don't, I don't need you to have full-time access. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's gotta be good enough for. No, for no, it's, 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 it's good enough for my purposes. <laughs> yeah. We'll talk, Josh, we'll talk then, later about full-time access, full-time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was trying to figure out how to do it. Like my problem was like the, the only way to do it is through like Zapier and Ift and things like that. And kind of trying to, to do it uh, is what I was doing last time. I didn't even know there was a Slack shortcut that allowed you to do that. Like, actually, I think a lot of my, uh, when, I, when I used to travel a lot, I think our employee, my, the employees probably would have appreciated, or at least the exact say, where's Josh right now? When is he exiting the plane? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what I did is I do, because um, I think it was like in thir- iOS 13 or 14, they did the automated triggers. Mm. And so you can set an automation based on when you turn off airplane mode. 
So when airplay mode comes off, my shortcuts run. Um, the first one that gets fired is like a text to my dad that like I landed. So he gets one before I get on a plane and get off of a plane. Um, and then when I turn off airplane mode, it runs the one. There's no like Slack shortcut per se. There used to be, but I think they removed it when they redid their whole app and things like that. But there's like ways around it. You can do, um, I basically have it send an email. Hmm. Um, and then that email address is the Slack ingest thing. So it's like, it's kind of a way. It'd be great if shortcuts supported like webhooks and then I could do things like that. But yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> I get like real into it. Cause like I got tired of like letting people know where I was and Mike was like, what time zone are you in and things like that. And so I was like, oh, well, I'll just build this location thing. And I was like, cause I, I think I used to do it when, uh, so Mike and I worked together at a previous company that did like insider threat stuff, um, based out of Baltimore, uh, that one was a little bit easier because I was always traveling between the three offices, basically London, uh, New York, and then San Francisco. And so back then it was a lot easier to do with IFT because you could set geofences. And so it, everybody got like a notification when I was in a specific office so they could know like where I was. Not to come in. And that, <laughs> yeah, they knew not to come in or like, because like I was fixing all the customer deployments and things like that. We did a lot of like on-prem stuff for banks. And so it helped out a lot for me because I didn't have to ask answer questions when I was like on a customer site because they would be like, oh, he's in London. Like, I'm not going to bother him. He's there's a very large bank in London. Like he's he's obviously busy. And so it helped right. answer questions when I was unavailable for answering questions. But yeah, always been fascinated by the location stuff and how to feed it. Yeah, I'm one of those people that doesn't really care about like privacy around that. But, you know. Hey. Well, you know, if, if I start when I if and when I start traveling again, when COVID's gone and so forth, I'll probably build a uh, where is Josh? Where in the world is Josh? <laughs> yeah, mine's the Carmen San Diego bot. I forget the name of it. It's the name of the villain, and Carmen San Diego is the name of the, the Slack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the name of my like when my email gets sent. Like that's what comes in. Um, only because I include the weather, and I don't think they appreciate it most of the time. Because I like all of last year, like I was I was in nice Asian beaches and things right. like that. So it was very depressing in the winter when you're freezing and I'm on a beach and it's you know oh, 85, I'm super, 90. I'm super, super depressed you're in Hawaii right now, but they have the two-week quarantine. So right. yeah. Well, I was in I was in Singapore and my visa expired. So I uh I had to come back to the United States because nobody was accepting American passports. Well, nobody is still accepting American passports anyway, so. I, I do to, think it's interesting that we um, we've totally geeked out on Hawaii and some other stuff, <laughs> but the fact that the two uh, that that you guys are used in uh, insider threat use case and Jonathan and I both came from a company that worked in that space, uh, not even touch that. I think that's kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, we were, which is go if on. We if we would have gotten like if we would have had more if we would have not gotten acquired by who we got acquired by. Um, it would have been an interesting way to feed in more data. Mm -hmm. So basically the gist was, uh, we were like, we were doing UEBA, which is user event behavior analytics, I think mm. before we got categorized that, but basically we'd suck in all these data feeds, um, and then correlate them back to a user. And then a user would get like a risk score and things like that. Well, and it um, all started with the project that Jonathan referred to earlier, uh, his, I believe it was your roommate doing the communication and looking at how uh, communication networks are built. That's where it really all started. Um, and, uh, was looking, yeah, so, at, yeah. looking at how the network is and looking for anomalies within that communication, looking for, uh, and then doing some analysis on that. And we could actually determine, uh, when someone might be a disgruntled employee, when they might be looking to leave. Um, and that was all without even, that was all signal analysis. That wasn't even looking at the content of the messages. Um, so there wasn't really any NLP. And then as we evolved, we got more and more into the inside threat um, use case and um, and UEBA or whatever eventually became called. Um, and I think the closest we ever got to location information was collecting door swipes was always, uh, I think it was always on the roadmap. I don't know that we ever, aside from our own internal uh, use case, I don't know that we ever, um, what or internal instance, but go on. What company did you guys work for? Uh, a company called Red Owl Analytics or Red Owl uh, up in Baltimore. Um, I don't know if I've, yeah. have you heard of Red Owl? Mary? Not sure. Oh. <laughs> it's yeah. all right we got acquired by uh 
we got acquired in what 2017 28 2017 2017 by, uh, four, 2017 a company called force point um which is owned by raytheon and mm-hmm. then so we got swallowed into that beast and then mike and i promptly left well um, i left right before the acquisition because i saw it coming but yeah um, and then <laughs> I got a retention bonus and then I stayed and then (laughs) couldn't make it the entire period and left. Um, But yeah, so the, it was, yeah. So it was one of my good buddies in college, like went on to be a Rhodes scholar and he was doing like network science stuff. And so when he went to Oxford, his like PhD was all in like network analysis and things like that. And so he started Red Owl Analytics while he was defending that thesis and like his original algorithms were like the baseline of this the software, but it was basically like, how do we ingest all this, this data? It was mostly around communication data. Cause obviously that's where we started with emails and things like that, because you can start to like get some interesting thoughts on like what's happening across the board, right? Like if an employee is getting ready to leave, they, they tend to stop emailing their manager as much and the frequency and stuff starts to change. And so you kind of have all these like signals that kind of pop up, which aren't necessarily interesting on their own. But once you start to correlate them across the board with like door swipes, oh, they're coming in later and later in the day, like these things start to to come up. And so we never really went down the, that sort of use case. It was more of like uh, financial customers, like insider trading, like, because we would ingest like phone transcripts and logs. And so you could start to detect when like the guy's like, oh, not over email. And then his phone rings immediately. Let's go private. Right. 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 Once we yeah. started doing NLP and stuff like that, it, things got more interesting. And then also looking for um, uh, communications and channels. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, a great way to sort of evade detection is uh, in uh, have two different um, uh, groups. Like if you have um, chat groups, right? Big public chat groups. Uh, if I send messages to Jonathan in one, uh, and Jonathan replies to those messages in a different chat group. Um, it doesn't look like we're ha- if you're just watching that group, it doesn't look like we're having a conversation. And there's so many other messages that are going back and forth in there because it's a large public group that our messages are just sort of lost in the noise. But if you then bring those two back together and you're looking at them in a more unified way, it becomes obvious that Jonathan and I are having this conversation and we're talking about things. And then we we look at what uh, sort of trades you were doing around those times, and and maybe there were some uh, some some uh, insider trading or some other, other things that were going on at that same time. The location data is super interesting, uh, in that use case, right? Then you start thinking about, well, were these people in the same vicinity? Um, did Did they they go grab some sort of face, right? Did they have some sort of face-to-face communication? Yeah. So like my thing on steroids. New product. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) No, I'm not going down that road again. I, uh, I've decided to work on problems that are really well, the technology, is good at solving rather than trying to solve hard problems that technology is not as good at solving. Um, we'll yeah, no, Gordon, Gordon Gecko would not have liked you guys very much. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I guess we were kind of using some location data per se, cause we were ingesting like uh, firewall logs and VPN logs. So you'd get the IP address and then we'd enrich with like that geolocation. But like, you know, you're just getting, I'm sure you guys know, you're just getting this like very general area, but yeah. like, things like that, because it was like, hey, why is Jim accessing the server from Romania at right. 12 p.m.? He's usually only working out of the Baltimore office, you know, things like that. That would have been interesting to grab all that data because you have all the interesting, like, people's laptops. I guess it would have, cr- we could have we could have cleaned up in the COVID world. <laughs> like, oh, like, these, like, once the devices start, like, dispersing more and things like that, like, oh. Uh, Oh, well, that's, I mean, that's what, Mary, we do on the cyber product side, right? Is the IP yeah. address uh, location mapping. Right. Yeah. I'm just thinking, like, the correlation of that along with all the different comms data, like, we could have gotten eerily accurate, like, because, like, we used to give people, like, scores, like, oh, this guy's, for insider threat type stuff, he's, like, at a risk score of, like, 80, right? Mm-hmm. And that would flag. Um, and then once we got acquired by Forcepoint, which has a bunch of, like, data loss prevention software and things like that. Um, it would trigger like higher thresholds of like lockdown. So you wouldn't be able to access certain systems once you hit a certain threshold and things like that. And I think it's a very, it would have been a very interesting thing to sell, right? (laughs) Everybody went remote. 
That is really good. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely not sleeping tonight. Like I have like nine more product ideas that like I could use <laughs> this location to that for. So yeah. Awesome. Well, so, yeah. um that's a good place to stop, I think. Um yeah. you guys have any final thoughts? Anything you want to share? Um, yeah, I guess one small plug, I guess. You know, we're oh, of course. <laughs> Yeah, we're um uh you know we're hiring a um correct me if I'm wrong, Mary. We're hiring a new did you freeze? Yeah, frozen. Um well we're hiring a new cybersecurity salesperson. So um actually uh kind of to your point earlier about you know how did we find a cyber business that found us? And so uh we realized when we came in the millions of dollars a year, we're like, you know what, we should probably invest and have a you know a person in charge of this. So um you know, we have an active application on our website right now and, you know, would love the best of the best to apply. Awesome. What's the website? Uh, xmo.io. Awesome. So our careers page, basically. Right. Awesome. Well, it's been a pleasure talking with you guys. Um, hopefully, Mary gets unfrozen soon. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, she no. It's been a... She said there was like a storm or something. I oh, that's right. I forgot. She might lose internet. So That's right. Yeah. Ah, COVID days. Uh, I got to... Got to just roll with things. Um, But yeah, it's been a pleasure having you on um, and hope to talk to you again soon. Definitely. Thanks for having us, uh, Mike, Jonathan, and Thor. Thor, I appreciate it. So Awesome.